You're listening to the Teak Nation Podcast, where we strive to educate, inspire, and entertain you with tips and lessons from frauders and friends of TKE. Hello, Teak Nation podcast listeners. Alex Swinson here speaking with you. It is Monday, November 15th. This is being released on Wednesday, November 17th, and it is almost Thanksgiving, which gets me very, very excited. One of my favorite holidays, Christmas, of course, being number one, Thanksgiving, probably number two, Uh, number three, President's Day bit of a dark horse there. Probably didn't know that about me. At any rate, we are excited to have a very special guest on today's episode. We're going to get right into it. Brad Retyke is going to be joining us. Brad is a graduate of Franklin College, the Rogue Salon chapter. Uh, For those who are avid listeners of the podcast, you know that Franklin College uh, is the preferred Institute of Higher Education here on the TK Headquarters staff, and the Rogue Salon chapter is the preferred chapter of uh, TK Headquarters staff. So um, a couple of really well-known, notable alumni who hail directly from Franklin College, and uh, I'm sure more on the way, but Brad is a very successful individual, a PR and communication specialist, has served um, in the office of the governor here in Indiana, served the uh, Donald Trump presidential campaign, as well as uh, under Mike Pence while he was vice president. So I'm sure a lot of fun stories Brad's going to share with us here coming up. We'll let him talk a little bit more about his bio and all of his accomplishments, and we're going to get right into it. Please welcome Brad Retyke. Frauder Brad Retyke. Brad is the founder and principal of Bar Communications, mentioned a little earlier in the intro that he spent some time in the White House as the director of cabinet communications, uh, deputy press secretary and policy director for Mitch Daniels, former governor of Indiana, Indianapolis Business Journal, 40 under 40 in 2020. That's pretty, pretty exciting there. Um, Did I cover everything that needs to be covered, Brad, or do you want to add anything to to the bio? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that was uh, you're more than uh, more than kind. So. All right, excellent. Um, one thing to to get us started here. So it has actually long been a dream of mine to be named to some sort of X under X list. Um, what sort of perks and access come with that forty under forty? I just want to prepare my thirty under thirties. Pass me by, but uh, I think I still got a still got a shot at forty. Well, you know, I, we got. That was announced in March of 2020, right? As everything was closing down. So I, I, been, I, I haven't met 35 of the other 40 under 40, uh, just because we, you know, we had one event and then, uh, and then it all kind of shut it down. But obviously, you know, <laughs> it's prestigious for podcasts like this to get me for those purposes alone. It's worth it. So. That's right. It's a conversation starter. Just uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. throw it out there. Did you at least get a plaque or certificate of some sort? We did, and really, for me, it was. Uh, I saw my wife had had been awarded, uh, had been named in that list a few years ago. So I was just trying to keep pace with her. Which, if you met my wife, uh, was I, very impressive. I, I got a lot of work to do there. So. <laughs> well, I, uh, I appreciate appreciate the context there. Um, I want to I want to start with a pretty broad, big quest, big picture question. So the three of us, obviously, very familiar with Franklin College. Many of our listeners are probably not. It's about eleven hundred students. Uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere, about 40 miles south of Indianapolis. Take us from Franklin College, where you graduated, to the White House. What did that journey look like? What, you know, are, are there any points which you felt you got a, a, a big break that kind of led to your breakthrough in the in your career field? You know, just what is that, what is that 20-year process, 15-year process look like to get from tiny little Franklin College to, to Washington, D.C.? I mean, you're, you you nailed it right on the head. Where several breaks. Uh, one, what I and what I learned, Franklin, above all, all else, is that, and through the fraternity, is that it's all about relationships. I'm not the first nor the last to ever say that, but for me, it has always been about relationships. I, I think I learned that probably freshman year at Franklin, um, when I was elected to st- student government, and was a was. Uh, given the opportunity to meet a lot of the trustees who were successful in their own areas of business. 
and I wanted to learn more about them. And so I, I had the chance to engage with them over that most of my college career, the last three years specifically at trustee meetings and other, um, you know, ribbon cuttings and things like that. And um, I, that led me to two internships. One was at One America uh, here, a insurance company based here in Indianapolis. Uh, another was with a law firm, Gene Henderson, who's a Franklin College alum who went to Harvard Law School and had a mid-sized law firm here in town. And I, and I thought maybe I wanted to be um, an attorney or pursue uh, law school after college. And I, I learned through both of those that I did not. So, so in many cases, knowing uh, the doors you don't want to go through helps helps direct you to the ones you do. I was an English major, never taken a political science or journalism class in my life, but somehow ended up in a communications shop at the White House. So you had to have a couple breaks. Um, I was I was all about going into the Peace Corps right out of college. And you know, Peace Corps it takes a variety of things. You got to line up the right person with the right need, with the right skill set. And I got deferred for a year. So I was like, well, all right, right out of college. I got to, what am I got? I got to figure out that first job. And I was doing a part-time job as a bartender um, at Jeff Street Pub, which I'm sure you both have <laughs> visited or driven by a time or two um, in Franklin. Um, not that it's a big town. And also worked for the mayor of Franklin, who was an amazing man named Norm Blankenship. And um, I got a call from a, another team, uh, Cam Savage, who's a senior when I was a freshman, who was working, who was the political director on this congressional race here in Indianapolis. It was 2002. They'd just redrawn the lines um, and made that district a little more Republican. It was, it's a Democrat stronghold. Uh, and he said, hey, well, hey, I'm sorry, you, you know, not pursuing the Peace Corps right now, but we got a job for you on this campaign. And I'm like, okay. I never really got involved and worked on many campaigns. I'd maybe stuffed envelopes for Senator Luger back in 2000, but uh, so I go on this, right? And this campaign is significant in the sense of the relationships of it. So there were a couple other fraternity brothers, uh, of our fraternity brothers who, uh, Robert Fanger, Al Inslee, who both worked on the campaign as well and just in various roles. But there was a woman on the campaign named Jana Amos, who was our finance director. And she, she, her job was to raise all the money and she was great at it. But we became friends. So um, after the, we lost, it was again, tough race, tough district, uh, we lost. She and I continued to be friends. And a year later, when I was actually going to the Peace Corps, she threw me a going away party. And at that going away party, she invited her boyfriend or a guy she was just kind of starting to date, a guy named Eric. And so at this party, Eric says, hey, Brad, I'm Eric, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I'm getting ready to go to the Peace Corps. He's like, that's interesting. I want to hear more about that. And so he and I went and had dinner a couple weeks later, right before, literally right before I left to go to Uzbekistan for the Peace Corps. And he said, well, hey, I, I really respect what you're doing and appreciate your willingness to do it. Stay in touch. And I did. So I would send every three weeks or so when I was in Uzbekistan, I'd get access to an internet cafe and I would send updates um, stories, you know, uh, in some happy, some sad, some just, <laughs> uh, you know, embarrassing. Uh, and I would send these to a growing list of people because I didn't have time to write everybody individually and I didn't have access to the internet. So Eric and I got to know each other while he was back home and he'd send me, you know, he and Janet would send me care packages every once in a while. And um, so I get back a couple of uh, 15, 15 months later, so this is early 2005. And Eric is now working for um, the governor at the time, Mitch Daniels, because Eric had been on running his campaign. And I, long story short, Peace Corps gets kicked out of Uzbekistan. I'm long. I'm no longer in the Peace Corps at this time. So, um, but uh, Eric says, "Well, hey, I got we got work for you. If you, we'd love to add a second person to our press office, and I like the way you write." So go interview with the press secretary, go interview with the chief of staff, and go interview with another another advisor to the governor. And somehow a guy who's never had a political science class or a journalism class in his life ends up in the press office for a governor. Now, the rest, I won't say the rest is history because I, I spent the next five years learning the press side of it from my boss and from not the governor, but also from my boss who's the press secretary, how to write a press release, how to talk to reporters, how to um, handle crisis communications all those kinds of things. It really grew as a professional. And then I learned the political side of it from, from Eric. Eric was the, the then governor's political guy who did a lot of outreach to organizations around the state and also to other governor's offices. And so in 2010, after I had um, been there for five years, I got offered from AT&T. Um, they said, hey, we want you to do some contract work. We uh, basically start your own LLC and come do work for us, which great opportunity. And um, I hadn't really thought about starting my own business, but I, I, my, I was dating my now wife, who was also um, working in, Mitch Daniel, in the Governor Daniels office with us. So I started my business. Now, 
the you guys being Indian residents know that um, or can probably guess that the ironic part about that story is my friend Eric who hired me into Governor Daniel's office is now governor of Indiana, Eric Holcomb. And it's, you know, and by the way, if he and he and I have talked about this, if you would have asked us at 2005, 2010, 2011, where we were going to be in 2016 on election night, I, I guarantee you he didn't think he was being elected governor of Indiana. And he, and I knew I wasn't sitting in Trump Tower on election night watching the new, newly elected president of the United States give his acceptance speech. Um, so we, I guess I skipped over a few years there, but um, I, so I, I built my business from starting 2010. I had one client, AT&T was my only client. We did work, uh, public affairs. So PR work that's more policy focused um, in both Indiana and Kentucky. So I, work, I don't lobby, but I work with a lot of lobbyists and try to help them explain kind of rather complex policy issues and get um, get reporters to care about it or get elected officials to care about it. Uh, and, and so I knew I was going to have two, I had two paths, one to try to grow and add more clients and maybe employees or try to work up within the at t ranks and have them hire me in house. And I got the opportunity to do both. Um, eventually in 2014, I was just getting married and they asked me to at t said, Hey, we want you to come in house. And that wasn't going to work to move to Nashville when my wife had a, a successful career here. So, um, but by then I'd grown to other clients. So now we do work with Walmart. We do work with um, Anthem, we do work on a, on a, on a big infrastructure project for HNTB down on the south side of Indianapolis, big interstate project. Um, but I guess the first version in 2016, as I was growing, I had a couple employees at the time, I get a call from my friend, again, relationship, somebody who I'd been friends with since probably 2005 through politics, is his name Marty Opes. And Marty, call, and Marty is running the former governor, well, former now vice president, Mike Pence's gubernatorial campaign. So he's running for, this is 2016. He's not been named the nominee. Well, then Donald Trump asked him, said, hey, well, we'd like you to be the nominee. So my, Marty calls and says, after, is a week after the Republican National Convention in Cleveland, he says, can you come help us out in Trump Tower? Yeah, <laughs> and I think, I, you know, I'm good. I'm, yeah, I, again, I, I understand that political lens, but I don't thrive off just scrapping in campaigns every day. I, I've been there, done that, and it was enjoyable. But I've, you know, I've got plays, I've got clients. I can't just, pack, you know, just, just throw it all. And I'm 35 years old. I can't just like move to New York and and give it all up. He said, "Look, just 90 days. Come help us out." <laughs> all right. And, and I talked to my wife, and she said, "Look, you know, it's New York. You can make some good national con connections for on the on the media side." So I said yes, which is another lesson that um, I, that people I, that I realize has done. Um, done me well over the years say yes when opportunities present themselves I can't do everything but um so I said yes so I moved out so I, I travel back and forth every week to New York thinking hey you know what it doesn't look like this is a I mean at that point no one would have predicted that we were going to win so like, okay I'll come out and do this spend some time in New York which is great um it'll be an intense learning experience build some relationships we'll probably lose and then I'll go home surprise <laughs> so uh, I mean, an election. So I thought next night they said, "Hey, can you come be on the transition team?" And, and I said, "Well, yeah, fine. I can do ten more weeks. Great. We'll get everybody walk, help the team, help build the team. Walk, you know, as I say, the bride and groom down the aisle, get them sworn in. Hey, guys, call me for Christmas party. I'll be back in Indiana." And then, uh, and that was the plan. Just to, I'll help out. And and that, honestly, the transition was probably some of the most. Um, interesting and fun parts of that whole experience is because it was a small team and you got to be up close in the middle of it because the rest of the team, we hadn't built the rest of the plane yet because we didn't really know we were going to have to build the plane. So, um, and, and then about three days before Christmas, I was summoned in New York because um, of, of, of actually another colleague from the campaign said, Hey, I want you to talk to the secretary of commerce about a job there. And I'm like, I, I was like, Peter, I'm not, I'm not going to go in. He's like, just humor me, come to New York and, and talk to that future secretary, Wilbur Ross. And so I did. And Sean Spicer walks into the war room and Sean, I knew Sean from the campaign. And he says, Hey, and he'd been named, I, I think he, yeah, he'd been named already that he was going to be the next press secretary. So he said, what are you doing here? And I told him, he said, well, Hey, don't, don't commit to anything. Cause we were hoping he'd be on the white house team. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh boy. I mean, it's been, and, you know, for having someone work, having worked in political communications, that is, I mean, it's, it's the dream job, right? I mean, you get to be there. 
but it was not something I was pursuing. I wasn't, it was in my dream job to work for Governor Daniels, although it ended up being a dream job. Um, it wasn't my goal to do that. It wasn't my goal to work in the White House. So I was fortunate and, you know, obviously then I'll be presented with that. So uh, my wife and I spent a couple of days together over the holidays and we just, you know, when we have kids and she said, look, let's make it work. So it was only going to be for a short time. Like I, I was never going to be a lifer for out there. Um, and so I tried to come back once a month and she would try to come out twice a month. I, I got a 466 square foot apartment about three blocks west of the White House. So that was cost as much as my mortgage for a much larger place back in Indiana. And yeah, and we just made it work. And I was by that point, an old man, I was at 35. I was an old man on that team because, you know, as, as many people tell you, politics is so much of a young person's game. So, but obviously being an old man was kind of what helped me be able to navigate those waters because I'd been in a governor's office. I'd worked for a guy who had worked in a couple of white houses. Um, so I knew, you know, there was, there was some maturity there that you, you hoped you brought with you. And, um, and it was there's one in getting to the White House, and then they, for those people in, in, that at work there, leaving on your own terms is, is another success, um, especially in the rough and tumble world of, of social media and 24 hour news cycle that we have now. Um, so I saw for I was there for 18 months, um, got to see a lot of really um, I say neat doesn't do it, really amazing. Um, things seeing I mean just walking up every day to those gates it's like, I'm what else I remember in 2006 when I tried to get a east wing tour and was so like, yeah sorry can't uh, we can get I know somebody to get those suddenly I'm the guy who's given them like is our given west wing tours I mean it, so you know I always appreciated that because because it was never something I expected there was such a level of appreciation that I, I had and they say anytime you think you're going to work at the white house you're like, man, I'm not really happy. That's time to leave. I never got to that point. And, um, and you know, and, and as I quoted my former boss, uh, former Governor Mitch Daniels, he said once, and I heard him say actually many times, never go to D.C. without an exit strategy. And I had one. And so I did my job. Uh, I, hope I, I hope I did it well. And um, in 2018, said I was announced that I was leaving and, and I came back to Indiana. Now, we kept our apartment out there for another year and a half because doing, and I just was going to go back and start my practice back up again, because he had to do, I did the best of it before I went in the White House. Um, so I went back and used those skills that I had learned there to add a new layer of, um, hopefully, uh, well, a new layer of um, acumen, maybe, <laughs> I don't know if you, um, an ability to understand crisis communications on a whole new level, um, for sure, because on my job in the White House on a, on a daily basis, I would, on a good day, I was we would push our message out through the cabinet agencies, and that was my job to play traffic cop and run that. On a bad day, I just inherited everyone's fires. And I'll let you um, think back over the last four years and hear how many bad days there were versus the, <laughs> the former. So, um, but amazing experience and and um, really have really proud to have had it and glad it's over. <laughs> so, as a friend of mine who worked in the um, first Bush administration said. Ah, uh, the White House, a better memory than an experience. <laughs> so I don't know that I agree, fully agree with that, but it was, uh, you know, pretty amazing. So, so Brad, I've, we've been lucky enough to interview a lot of prestigious folks, and I have never been nervous, admittedly, in having any of those conversations. I got to say, I'm, I'm nervous for two reasons in, in this interview with you. One is, you might be the only person who could talk faster than I can, which is impressive <laughs> because I try to slow myself down. So when you and I talk, it's just going 100 miles an hour. Two is, you have known me since I took my tour to possibly come play golf at Franklin College, walking with my parents in the middle of campus, and you stopped us while you were uh, playing campus golf, which is a whole nother, whole nother episode about uh, hitting a tennis ball with a golf club across campus and trying not to hit people, although I think we got a stroke off if you did that. And so meeting my parents at that point, but then also being, uh, you were a senior when I was a freshman. So you got to see the 18 year old immature uh, version of myself come to campus and help to inspire me with a few leadership lessons. So I get nervous because Lord knows what, what stories you could go into just on, on that year of my life. But I'm curious, 
you were my my freshman year, your senior year, you were the president of student congress. And so in your leadership role as a president of student congress, but also as an officer in the chapter, because even though you weren't an officer in your senior year, you were very influential. You're very, you know, worked with a number of the folks who were officers in the chapter. What are some of those leadership lessons you learned at that point that you took forward as you went to the White House? You worked obviously at the state house here in Indianapolis. What are some of those lessons you picked up in engaging with the fraternity that have lasted with you for life? And that's, and that's a great question. You know, I, I never, I never had a jeweled office in the fraternity. I was, I, I was, I was rush chair once, social chair once. And, um, but I never, I, I may have ran for jeweled office. I never had it though. I always hope, and you guys, you guys know who are, you know, as working at nationals that it can't just be the people, it can't just be the officers that, that fight every battle. You gotta have some, you know, gotta have some of the non-commissioned guys. You gotta have the enlisted people step up. So if you can have some people who may have um, the skill set to be a jeweled officer or the skill set to be a bigger role, but they don't necessarily need the title or they don't, or they can operate without the title, that is such a huge asset to what you do. And I learned that in student Congress, I had, um, I, I had the title, but I always, it was so, it, what was amazing, I think it was my, was it was a senior year, maybe it was my, yeah, it was a senior year. We probably had 12, 10 or 12 members, like freshmen, ju sophomores, juniors, even a couple of seniors who were also in state government or who was also in student government, um, but didn't necessarily have the title. And so it was, you know, just running that organization, especially when it comes down to counting votes, uh, when you knew you had other people who could be relied upon to help, that's just, that's great. Um, when you're the student body president, you and you're also active in the fraternity and living in a house like I lived in the house, you look at things a little differently. Just like the party is never as much fun for the chapter president as it is for the person who has no responsibility whatsoever, because you got to think about things differently. Just like I would be, you know, in the chapter, but I'm thinking about the ramifications of what we do with the school because I often had to be in that role to negotiate things behind the scenes. Um, so you, you learn how to influence without authority. I, I, that's probably the best way to say yeah. it is how to how you can impact change, but it doesn't have to come top down because um, you're not at the top. You're so you're somewhere else in the middle. So you have that. I mean, the, the fraternity, I college and fraternity specifically helped me develop socially. Um, I, I probably wasn't the coolest kid in the world. When I came to Franklin College and I'm necessarily say I'm the coolest kid right now. Um, but obviously the forced engagement and, and candidly that the fraternity, you see people at their best and worst and how to learning how to handle both is critical because the average person you work with, the average person you see it, I mean, the, the see you just on the street, unless you get to be one of, they get to be one of your closest friends. you never really see people at their worst. It's all, we're all kind of, buttoned up a little bit and you're not necessarily sharing everything. Filtered. We, live, we live in a filtered world, right? With social yes. media and everything else. No, that's a, that's exactly a filtered world. Um, so I, I learned how to deal with controversy when I was in the fraternity. Cause you know, and by the way, it might've been over something really petty and stupid, but you saw how to handle it. And sometimes you saw how not to handle it. And I, it's why I, my wife is, my wife's a, Kappa Alpha Theta, uh, um, and my brother followed, it, and he was a, he was a Delta, and my sister's a Tri Delta. My parents were never Greek, so I didn't really know what to expect, and I was the oldest. But having had that experience as a teak, um, I, well, I mean, I'll just say it: four of the six groomsmen in my wedding are teaks, and only one of those was in school at the same time I was. The other three are all older, who I just got to know through other people, and there's, those are my best friends who have seen me at my best. And at my worst. Um, so one another lesson I think is um, because it, because you you saw it happen um, is don't unnecessarily burn bridges and it is or be quick to apologize and just sometimes just say, yeah I screwed up I screwed up and I um, because on the latter being forthcoming and just saying that it makes the fix a whole lot better. And I got and I tell clients this all the time like did you do something wrong? Well. Did you do something wrong? How can, how can, and, and obviously there's how you, how you say you're sorry is, is, um, it's a whole different lesson, uh, but admitting that fault, but also not necessarily 
um, ending relationships prematurely. I can tell clients that as well. Like, I know you want to, this legislator did, said something you didn't like. There's no, there's no value. There's no win in you destroying that person or trying to say something unkind about him, him or her because it's only going to just make things more complicated. And it's going to be hard to walk back, especially, Donnie, to your point, social media, the internet is forever. That's, I mean, if, if, by the way, I got, I got lucky. I graduated in 2002 where we didn't have cell phone cameras. I mean, it, and, and not because, you know, with some out of control, you know, immature kid, but it's easy things that are pictured. You don't always get a chance to explain yourself. Context matters. And sometimes if you're not there to be able to explain what something, yeah, it just, it's a hard thing to do. So you got to always understand that one, again, the internet is forever because there's things out there. Well, I deleted that tweet. Well, not really. Somebody who's really good at research can find it. I learned that in the white house because people would want to come work for us and we have to vet them. And then we'd find something that they said or did that was inappropriate years ago. And sometimes that was a disqualifying factor. So go ahead. Do you feel like the, the focus on creating relationships and fostering relationships, do you feel that that happened during your time at Franklin? Because I recall, again, a story, you introducing me to all of the people in campus security. As a young freshman, especially in my second semester, I was one of the, the leaders of the pledge class at that point, right? And you basically pulling me aside and said, okay, you got to go learn who these guys are and introducing me. And that helped me the rest of my college career back to explaining in context, right? If you had a relationship with a, a campus security person, they came over to a social event and you were you walked out of the house, not them coming in and investigating. You walked out front and said, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what's happened, right? That was a completely different dynamic that helped me for the rest of my collegiate career and as an officer in the fraternity versus if I would have just said, oh, campus security, they're out to get us, right? You, I'm sure you remember these days. It still happens today, right? Security's out to get us. School's out to get us. Everybody hates us. And forming those relationships, was that the, really the genesis was during your college career of learning the value of that? I would always say, yeah, absolutely it was. Um, I would always say that the world is a whole lot easier to navigate where you know where all the landmines are. And also where the landmines are not. Um, by, by knowing Steve Leonard, head of Franklin College Security to this day, I saw him earlier this year when I went down, um, actually Governor Holcomb and I went down for the Franklin College Hanover Bell game because he, he's a Hanover graduate. And Steve Leonard got the out of the car. Hey, Brad, known the guy for now almost 25 years. Now, I, did, I didn't get to know him because it benefited me in any way. I got to know him just because I, I enjoyed meeting. I genuinely enjoy meeting new people. He's a good guy. And, and it's, yeah, and he's a great guy. And you find a lot of interesting people if you just don't look on the ground all the time and, and make the chance to, like, like you on the, on Cape, I didn't know you were going to come to Franklin, but Hey, <laughs> I know what it was like to be on that tour and how intimidated I was as a high school senior. What would make me feel better at that? If somebody knew me, somebody knew my name, somebody cared. So I, I was, I appreciated that. So why not do it to other people? And why not if, you know, if, and by the way, no one in the world has ever been offended by a thank you note. It's just not. So why not you do it? I mean, things you, when people send you a text, Hey man, we're just thinking about you. Hope you're having a good week. That's awesome. So I need to be, and that's on me to do that more often. So, but you're right. It started at that, that level because um, I, I say every other, every conversation I have when I meet someone new, it's a race to find the common ground. So I start asking questions, where'd you go to high school, you know, and, and trying to try to, cause you're eventually you'll figure out some connection like, oh yeah, you like the color red. Well, my, you know, I, that's, I'm using that as an right. example, but, and then life's a lot easier. And well, again, it's, go ahead. it's also a great lesson for any of our collegiate leaders who are listening in about recruitment, because I mean, it's crazy to think how the world works. And obviously you told your story of all the places that you have gotten to, right? But I'm on that campus tour with my parents. If you don't stop and say hello and make me more comfortable and also just introduce yourself. Well, then when we, when I actually come to school there and we go through recruitment, you know, had a number of folks that I knew from playing sports there, but also had met you. It made that completely different and helped my relationship to want to join Teak. And now the position that Alex and I are in today, it's just, uh, it's crazy to think that, you know, that happenstance and you being a leader in that way, how that can influence the trajectory of people's lives, right? I mean, just never know. It could have completely changed the trajectory of my life if you wouldn't have introduced yourself in that one moment. And, and, and anybody can do that. It doesn't, you don't have to have a special skill set to just be, to just show you care or just show, like, be helpful. Hey, anything I can, you know, can I help point you in the right direction? 
you know, and and, um, and that is especially when you're talking about chapter development early on. Those kind of I mean those those orientations, those um, pre you know the when the high school math competition happens, you know, in February of the previous year, and you're and you and you your chapter has volunteer members, and you find some of these kids like, oh hey, because they're gonna when they come to campus in the fall, they're gonna gravitate for the one person they've seen one time before, and you have that advantage. You get one, you get to kick the tires a little bit and kind of see them in a different situation. Um, and, and you know, I mean, I remember the Lambda Chi president who I met during my orientation. Now I obviously didn't become a Lambda Chi. But I saw that guy in professional circle the other day. I remembered how cool I thought he was because he was the, one of the first seniors that ever like pretended to care about me. Maybe I'm not saying he was pretending, but you know, um, that I got to meet. And so that is why it matters, especially as you're when a lot of times chapters have like, you know, sophomores as rush chair because they got the energy and they're fired up. But going back to the military, the non, the non-jeweled officer people who can make contributions if you can find your seniors who people are naturally going to be drawn to who are like who can go to those um go to the rush chair said look use me however you want help me be, let me close you 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 uh you cook up you get put the fish in the water you bait the hook i'll bring them in great and i mean it's a, such a obviously i think it's a good foundation for just a future skill set but if you can do it especially as it relates to chapter development that is that's the key because like we all want to be liked and we all want to be around, spend our time with limited time we end up have free time having around people we like. So if we can, you know, you know show, put our teaks, put our best foot forward and show that we are likable people, we are caring people. Um, I, I think it pays off in spades every time. So, yeah, I, I think those, I mean, those lessons are directly in line with, with everything we talk about with recruitment. So I'm, I'm glad you brought them up and I'm glad you're, um, you're comfortable sharing some of those some of those stories as well. Uh, I want to jump back to something you said earlier when you were uh, going through the, especially the last five years or so, when you were talking about your good days and your bad days and uh, what what you know what separated those. I I'm curious, you know what what were some of the biggest challenges you faced working in a presidential administration? Um, you can be specific to Trump. You cannot be. I'm sure those challenges may have been a little different than the challenges faced during the Reagan administration, but, um, or just <laughs> in general, um, you know, what, what did you get into? You're like, holy crap, was not expecting this. Didn't think that I'd be dealing with this today. And then what were some of the pieces that, that made that job really rewarding and, and allow you to still look back on it fondly? Yeah. I mean, I know you were joking and probably more of a style, um, than um, anything else about the <laughs> Reagan white house versus the Trump white house. <laughs> But I, I, the big difference is, and I referenced it earlier, the so, social media and the 24-hour news cycle I, um, made it because you're everything is um, put under. You're, I mean, it's a, it, you, you live in a fishbowl, you're working in a fishbowl, but everything is um, micro-analyzed. And it's and it's interesting to work in public relations here in Indianapolis and then I do work out in DC because DC the media is held up on high because the political world media is so important so like a reporter out there it can be treated like royalty because they have the ability to sway so many opinions but based on an article a tweet anything so and here in Indianapolis they're not given nearly the respect I think they should and probably not nearly paid as well as they should be um, because it's just people have other things going on but in DC it's just that and that's the DC culture um, to an extent. So one, I was always surprised. I had, I had TV in my office and there was one channel within the White House that had, if you turned on one channel, it had MSNBC, CNN, uh, Fox Business and Fox on. And of course you could see all four channels there. And it was amazing that every day I looked up and to think like you're working on something that is, on, it is leading the news every single day. And that was because President Trump made news and a covered every single tweet, every single thing he did. So it was rare other than like a national international tragedy that we weren't on TV. And I, you know, and I, I guess maybe I should have expected it, but it was, it was just amazing because even now, if you turn on the news, it's not, I mean, it's, it, that was just him. And, and honestly, he was a performer. We forget this guy was, has been a celebrity most of his life. So he understands how to control, um, publicity good bad and different doesn't mean he always, it's always what he wants but he gets it. so um challenges like like many things are you know you got you always have people who are trying to climb to the top and are um 
you know, sometimes view you as a way. The, the best thing that happened is when people realized at, as a married 35-year-old guy who lived elsewhere, I wasn't trying to take their job or date their girlfriend. When they realized that they weren't, they didn't have to compete with me. Like, guys, I'm just here to help. I'm here to do a job, serve my time, and then leave. It was amazing how, how, how much easier the world got. People were like, oh, so you're not trying to compete with me. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm just here to do, you know. But I guess it's natural because they're 25 and they want to, they want to, you know, be the next Tron Spicer, next whatever. So you always had to do it. You had to manage those kinds of things. Um, some of the real rewarding things were I, um, I, one of the responsibilities I just assumed was picking our interns. Um, and you and talk about Donnie, I, I appreciate his kind words about, you know, conversations that are had at a young age that can, you know, alter the course of, future, of the future. I mean, when you get when you pick someone for a White House internship, like you potentially change their career forever. I mean, if they as long as they don't screw it up, like you're you're going to have that. For, like, I, I mean, I had some nice internships, but nothing like White House intern on my, you know, at 19 years old. Um, and it's been great to see those some of those, some of those interns progress um, because I know the people who invested in me at a young age. So I try to do the same to the extent I can and and have watched them now scatter across the country and do a variety of different things and my goal is always end up working for one of them. <laughs> that would be a real sign of accomplishment is if you end up working for one of your old interns. But um, some of the amazing things you see, like I was, I was in, uh, I had the privilege of going to Israel uh, on the advance team for the president's first international trip. He went, he did, went to five countries. So I spent 12 days in Israel. He was there for 36 hours, but we were there prepping that. And then, um, and then he, he did seven different, stops, I think six or seven different stops there. But to see it, he's beloved in Israel. Um, was and still is, and to see behind the scenes how hard it is to make that a trip like that look easy. And on our best day, it didn't always look easy, but because the footprint is probably five to seven hundred individuals, military and otherwise, on the ground, assets that are working to pull off a thirty-six hour trip to Israel. And obviously, it matters and it's important. But man, did I not realize how hard it could be. Um, so, and that and it was kind of outside of my normal roles. Flying on Air Force One, I mean, there's, yeah, that's just you, you just don't get to, to recreate that. I, I I was really fortunate. The last my last 48 hours in the White House were um, better than I deserved. Yeah, my wife came out. I was, I was going to leave on this on Friday. I had bought a ticket, a one way ticket out of DC for that Saturday, and I'd given them a month's notice. Say, hey, and they and they knew it was coming. And so my wife flies out, and throws me this wonderful going away party um, on that Wednesday night, and. Um, Really, really and, she, and she was so supportive couldn't have done it without her um and it was really a team effort just in just under we figure out ways to communicate and you know stay in touch even though our schedules were both busy uh then that the following thursday i had tickets that following day i had tickets to um to the kennedy center to take my wife to see hamilton she's a huge theater fan and i had seen hamilton because i went with mike pence a week after the election in new york and if you if you remember that story, we were not necessarily well received. And so she um, she couldn't believe that I got to see Hamilton before she did. And I, I, I she listened. I'd heard all the soundtrack, and I wanted it to be bad, but it's not bad. It's good. And <laughs> uh, so so finally, my last night in the White House, I get to take her to the Kennedy Center in the president's box to um, to see it. So, I mean, but that but that day, I get a call, and someone says, hey, "The vice president would like to see him." So I'm like. Okay, that doesn't happen all that often, yeah, um, or ever really. And so I knew, I knew because it was my second to last day. I, I had an idea what it was about, and you know, he came in, we took the pictures, and he's like, "Sit down." And so we sat there and talked for fifteen minutes. And obviously, I'd known him from the campaign, but and we, it was just one of those things where you're sitting there talking about, and we were reminiscing. I was telling him about the Hamilton. We were reminiscing about the first time we had um, when we had gone, and he's like. Yeah, I didn't think it would be that kind of a that big of a deal. I'm like, what? <laughs> you just got elected vice president of the United States and you're going to Hamilton on Broadway. Oh yeah, it's gonna be a big deal. So um, but just kind of sitting there in the in the West Wing having a conversation like that. Um, it was it was it was great. And and if you work on the White House staff and you behave like a professional, a lot of times you will get a departure photo with the president, you know, go in, say hello and photo and you know post that you can have it to post forever well the president was in europe the week i left so but i but i was again relationships i was nice to a lot of his people a lot of my colleagues so they said oh well, we got to make sure you get that photo so a month later i came back 
And I, I so I was in, I'm standing outside the Oval Office, my turn to go in, and the only people in the office are the chief of staff, John Kelly, the president, and the photographer. So I'm walking across, and the president's like, Brad, uh, what's, what's up? Brad, like, I'm not pretending like we're on first name basis here, but he, you know, but he, you know, so, and I mean, he recognized me, you know, we go around the campaign and been, you know, been on the team. And so we sit there and, and we're talking and he's, and he's going that night to, to Evansville, Indiana for a rally for Mike Braun, who's a, who's running for United States Senate. I said, well, hey, Mr. President, uh, I, I know you'll be very popular down in Evansville. I'm sure they're lined up around the corner. Um, this, I, I knew how to talk to him <laughs> and, uh, very popular. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they can't wait to see it. I said, I'd be, I'd be there myself if I wasn't flying home. He's like, well, fly with us. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> oh boy. I, you know, you, the best part about the guy is you never know what's going to happen next. Some might say that it's the most challenging part about the guy. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> so he's like, he turns to General Kelly. He's like, General, we can take the big plane or the small plane. Cause there's different size air force ones, depending on the runway. And General's like, <laughs> you can tell he's like shaking his head, like, you inviting the rando guy to come? <laughs> <laughs> and General's like, oh, we're taking the small plane. And the president's like, oh man, it would have been great to have you fly with us. <laughs> it's like, and then he starts telling me a story about Bobby Knight. He's like, Bobby Knight, just talk to him. You know, he says, don't ever come to Indiana without, without giving me a call. Winner. <laughs> He's, like, you know, he's going to be on the road with us. It's going to be great. And I'm just sitting there like, this is amazing. Like, you know, you sit there having this conversation and told the story about Bobby Knight by the president of the United States. And I will, I, I have that photo and <laughs> of him. And it's not just a posed photo. It's of us, uh, him talking to me, telling me the story. And I will never forget that moment. Um, so, yeah, and they're obviously really uh, some of the best people I've ever worked with in my entire life are from that White House now. Some of the worst people I've ever worked with in my entire life. Were also from that. But um, but I think it comes with any any organization like that. But um, yeah, and I could tell. So I could bore you with stories for days about being in different rooms and you know times when you know there, somebody did try to come after me or someone you know leaked a story to try to hurt a colleague and how frustrating that can be. But I'll save that for another time. But uh, it, it was a truly special experience, and especially to think about it as some guy who what was I probably 20 years old when I met Donnie and, and um, yeah, it, I mean, who would have thought 15 years later, I'd be ended up, you know, even getting to see that. But I guess the, the, the conclusion of that story to my last day, I was supposed to fly that commercial flight on Saturday home to Indiana one way. And my buddy says, why are you flying a commercial? The vice president's flying to Indiana on Friday, just ride with us. So my last flight at my last day in the white house, I flew home on air force two and <laughs> again and they got me a cake and you know and he said and you know it was it was better than I deserve so I'm curious because usually when we talk to folks who are running some amazing circles we like to ask who's the right who's the one person that is famous or the person you never thought you'd meet so we're gonna have to go non-presidential division because you've already <laughs> dropped right I've you know I'm hanging out with the president vice president and all the folks, you know, the interesting piece, because a lot of our listeners aren't from Indiana. So to understand Eric Holcomb as the governor, and basically you guys have known each other, you know, from a very early stage of his, is pretty, is very, very interesting. Um, but I'm curious, who are folks being in the White House? You know, you maybe you come around a corner, right? And there's the prince of XYZ country or XYZ celebrity who you never thought you'd see. Who are, you know, what were some of those three or four folks that you saw you don't have to go deep into the story unless you want to but just oh, folks who is right because that's the piece that's always interesting i think as alex and i travel around and lord knows we're uh you know you know a little speck on your shoe in terms of celebrity and things you've gotten to do right but people always say that of like who have you gotten to meet and we've gotten to meet some really cool people but i can't imagine if i was working in the white house you could bebop around a corner to go to the bathroom right and there's xyz <laughs> You know, there, I, my brother thought I was pretty cool. My brother is an amazing individual. He's a, a major in the Marine Corps. He's at the Pentagon right now. Um, but I was giving him a West Wing tour. And around came around the corner came Ted Nugent, uh, Kid Rock, and Sarah Palin. And just, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, just kind of ran, you know. Um, you know, it was great when the Cubs came in with the World Series trophy as a lifelong Cubs fan. Oh, yeah. That was pretty amazing. But uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't, know, I don't know if you saw Brad my Braves won the World Series. I don't know if you caught that. If you noticed that. <laughs> I, I did. I, yes. So congratulations. Thanks. It, Arnold Schwarzenegger has got to be that probably that person, and just because he's you know international celebrity, and I didn't meet him at the White House because 
if you remember, he did The Apprentice after the president did The Apprentice and they didn't necessarily love each other's performances. But a friend of mine uh, is, a, is a lobbyist out there and but it used to be Schwarzenegger's fundraiser out in California. So I get a text one day like, hey, do you wanna smoke a cigar with Schwarzenegger? And I, well, that answer is always yes. So yeah. So there's like six of us and we sat out at Jeff's balcony and um, I mean, for an hour and a half. I mean, just, and he's a regular guy. Like he's, <laughs> but he's larger than life. I found out that uh, if you really wanna make him mad, put him in a private room. That guy likes to be out with the people. Like he wants to be seated in the center of the restaurant because he's just, and, um, and I've met, other famous people who, um, you know, you see him and you're like kind of disappointed. Like that guy's kind of a jerk or she's, she's not very nice or whatever. Nope. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Great. And so um, a cool, cool story. Just stop you there between how we tie this all into the fraternity. Alex and I were doing a visit to USC a few years ago and he has, he's involved with the school out there. He may even have a, a, a child that goes to school there. But anyway, to your point about wanting to be out with the people, we're walking across campus after we visited with the group and we're just doing our normal walk across campus, engage with people. Schwarzenegger is in the middle of campus. Literally, there's a crowd of people around him. And Alex and I like, I, there's a crowd around this, but let's like us, right? Because dummies, like, let's go see what this is all about. So we bebop over there. And Schwarzenegger is literally just holding court in the middle of campus with a bunch of people. And <laughs> we just walk up. Like, this is this is amazing. So he's, that is legit. <laughs> yeah. And you just, you know, you, um, yeah, you get to, and just to spend time with him like that. And he's a sincere guy. And I get why he, you know, uh, got elected to governor because he's a man of the people as far as, you know, that's what the persona he puts off of. So that's probably one of the really interesting um, ones, especially from the time during NDC. Uh, you know, you've, you've met my fair share of athletes and um, and some of them are, you know, more engaged than others. But the Schwarzenegger, and then obviously, the, you know, it, to think about it, the biggest celebrity ever would probably be Donald Trump. Probably be, it would be just as far as he, it, 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 it's weird to think about 20 years from now. And like the fact that you like work for the guy is, is, um, is interesting. And he would have people that would pop in that would, that would just pop in the white house that were friends of his and you'd kind of you know like ted nugent being there i mean that guy legend and he could, he's just wearing a cowboy hat and jeans and probably thinking about if he could hunt on the south lawn <laughs> but uh, um yeah yeah so that kind of part was oh it was neat to see those people but it was uh more encouraging when they turned out to be good people and of course that's one lesson you learn they're all real people some of them are just a little more buttoned or a little more screened or filtered, as you said, Donnie, um, than others. So. Well, I think uh, there's another podcast episode in here called The Biggest Jerks That Brad Has Ever Interacted With. Um, <laughs> but uh, we can uh, we can get to that, uh, get that next time. Um, Brad, my last question, and, and you've, you've covered a lot of really great lessons. I think you talk about relationships. You talk about, I think the lesson about saying yes to opportunities is huge and, and always go through those open doors. Even You know, don't play small, but looking forward, looking at your future, right, and building out the firm and continuing to, to move on, I'm sure you have no idea what it's going to hold because you probably didn't expect 10 years ago where you'd be right now, but what lessons have you taken away from the last five or six years that you are going to employ in your life and, and you feel are going to help you continue to be successful moving forward? Well, right now we have, there's a, I have a team of four. There's third, so, um, and people ask, like, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to build a you know, big firm or not? And I say, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, and it's not because I haven't thought about it. I want to grow at an organic, a, a rate that makes sense. I want us to like each other. I want us to enjoy the work we do. I want us to like our clients. By the way, sometimes you got to make, sometimes you got on the, on the client part, you got to make some decision, tough decisions and, and give up revenue because you just don't, they're just not, there's not a respectful relationship or a mutually beneficial one. Um, so I think, the, I mean, and the other kind of basic lesson is stay in touch. As you get older, as I get older, I'm 40. And if, you, especially you do something like I do, where your network is a good, is going to cultivate, that's where the business is going to come from. People I know, um, you got to stay in, you got to stay top of mind. You got to um, be around. You got to show up and att attend things. My wife's a lobbyist and she, um, she does, she, she gets that world. So, um, so at least it's nice to have a partner that does that, that knows that too, but sometimes it's exhausting. We'll be, we'll sit around, we'll be here on Sunday and we'll say, what's your week like? And realize that we're not going to have dinner with each other the whole week. And that you, we just deal with it, but it's, and we'll, you know, we'll, we try to carve out time the next weekend, but 
using if you if you have the privilege or the benefit of being able to have a, a big network, what you do with it matters. Connecting people, helping people find jobs. I got three people right now that I'm trying to find jobs this week that have jobs right now, but are looking for something different. Um, not necessarily people you'd expect. Obviously, helping people those kind of first two years out of school where you're trying to figure out and you're trying to what direction to go in. And, you know, maybe the first job you get isn't what you really want or what maybe you're sold a bill of goods or maybe you just need to pay bills. So you got to take something. And then you realize, man, I'm not happy and I don't want to have to jump from this iceberg to another one. That's tough, man. And I, I'd say it's two, maybe three years before they, I mean, I, I almost like a probationary graduate of college. And that's why I try not to judge. If I see some, you know, I'm looking at a resume and I see that maybe somebody had struggled right out of college. I don't write them off like that because I, I got lucky, but I didn't, but um, not everybody does. And that's what, and then one of the people I'm trying to help is, um, is kind of a similar situation. And so what you do with that network matters because I think you, there is a responsibility to invest in the people, even if you're someone who says, you know what, no one ever helped me. So I don't care. Every job I've had in my entire life, going back to when I was mowing lawns in like middle school or high school, has been because I knew someone. It is 100 I mean, for my being an associate at Galleons Trading Company, which is now Dick's Sporting Goods, to my job at the feed store in college, to my job at the bar, you know, all of those have been because of someone I've known. So uh, I, that lesson will continue to be, and, and also from a business perspective, if I can help other people get new gigs, in 20 years from now, they may remember that and maybe that'll be a client. I don't, that's not why I do it. It's the right thing to do is why I do it. There are now, there are, there are potentially ancillary benefits from that. So I would say, and honestly, having that exposure to DC, this is what one of the things we, and you guys are working in Indianapolis. As when you go to some of these small schools, I know you got teak chapters all over. A lot of them are out in small towns and don't and attract people from small towns. Obviously, I know Donnie's from Terre Haute, so it's not exactly a small town, but and so these people don't necessarily have exposure to the Indianapolis business community or bigger things. I think it was so important, and I, and I offer to do this um, to with through friends of college. Like if I can help, you know, someone wants to shadow me, or someone wants to learn more about what I do, like it is on me to to let them know that because if they don't think anything. If they don't know any better, they may think, you know, maybe I need to move back to this town I grew up in and take a job at the same place my parents worked at. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that, but you should know that there's at least other options and then make your decision based on that. So I think um, having me going to DC, um, even if I was at a later age and not necessarily the, you know, people going out in their twenties, knowing how that place works will forever um, change and impact for the better how I operate here in Indianapolis. Um, and also it makes me, I don't say good for all time zones, but that's a, a phrase I like to use where you're, you're kind of well-rounded and have a good understanding of other things. And there's plenty of things I know nothing about, but to the extent that I can continue to challenge myself to be good for all time zones, um, I, I think is a, you know, the aspirational <laughs> pursuit. So. Brad, I appreciate you giving us so much time. My my final question I have is around culture. Um, I am the beneficiary. You've spoken about you know the opportunities you've had and being blessed, and I, I consider myself the same way. Beneficiary that I was basically raised in a culture in the fraternity at our chapter, and that experience for such a since we you mentioned a small school in the middle of nowhere that. Uh, as Alex and I, whenever we travel around and people say, where'd you go to school? And we tell them, and they, of course, have never heard of it, um, to produce so many people who, like yourself, who have come to be very, very successful. And there's so many other folks that aren't on the podcast that have found success. And some of them are principals of a high school, right? Not necessarily people going to the White House or people like Alex and I, that get to travel around the country, right? But they are unbelievably dynamic human beings and really good at their role. What in that culture for, for alumni who are listening or, or some of our chapter leaders who are listening, just people who are in business, they want to build that culture. What do you think is the special sauce in the culture that you were a big part of being at, in, the, in the fraternity and in your chapter that helped to create and sustain success, but also successful people? Because there were definitely people from multiple backgrounds and multiple thought processes and multiple uh, political parties, right? Everything that was able to be molded together. And you were a big you're a big part of that. And I know I've been a beneficiary of it. And so is Alex. So what are some of those elements that you saw in that chapter? I think 
and I think a lot of us, if we're honest with each other, try to try to figure this out, but it's hard to do. Using people, using people's strengths. So, you know, being your accountant, not my strength. So don't try to make me be the accountant. Like that's why I'm not chapter treasurer. If I've got if my my strength that I bring or my asset that I bring is campus relationships, then maybe you, I, you slot me into a different role. Um, you people, the people who are great at talking to people, you, they're the fishermen. Go go fish. You, you you go fish. Bring them here, and then let's set up our other people just to be successful. Like when you try to force people into a role that they're not necessarily comfortable with or um, good at, and then, and it, it, there is a problem that sometimes people think they're good at one area and they're not. <laughs> so you got to how do you how do you build that around? That is, and this is what I have to do. I challenge. I, I struggle with what I have to work on every single day. I'm writing a proposal right now that's um, I'm sending in later this afternoon, where it's going to talk about here's our team. I'm going to play this role. My, my colleague Katie's going to play this role. My other colleagues are going to play these roles. Um, so I think it starts with that being really self aware of what assets do you already have? What assets need to be cultivated? Like where where are we where are the gaps? What do we need? To, you know, and then. But it takes that self awareness, and self awareness is 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 hard because no one really wants to. Like Alex, you wouldn't want to walk next door and say, "Hey, tell me why I'm um, bad at my job." I'm not saying you're bad at your job, but like you would be curious that that person says, "But you don't really want to hear it." Like you don't really want. <laughs> so, um, and, and obviously, you hope they say nothing, right? But you're you know so, um, but being aware of, of the shortcomings and also thinking ahead you got to think three three steps ahead or whatever the number is because so many people just get focused on me 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 or us right now but what, how actions you take as an organization or as an individual have consequences and benefits down the road and if you are constantly focused on the 10 you know so 30,000 feet in the air 10 you got to be able to go back and forth and uh, it's like what they say when you train for a half marathon which I haven't run in a while but at one point did I say, keep your eyes on the horizon. Cause if you, when you look just down at the feet in front of you, which is natural for us, cause we're looking for potholes. We're looking for obstacles that might, that might trip us up, but you're supposed to keep it on the horizon. And that's as an organization thinking about those types of things as, as a chapter, you know, like one bad rush can throw off, can throw off the culture fraternity. We, we had a challenge with that. It came before you guys, but two classes ahead of me, they had a really bad year. And so when um, when I was a, a, a sophomore, we didn't have any senior leaders. We had, there was only a handful of them because somebody for whatever reason took their eye off the ball. There's other circumstances that happen and you gotta kind of constantly think about that. And which is why you gotta be careful about the people you're bringing in too and what, are, what, are, what's, what kind of culture are they gonna add? Because if you bring in a bunch of bad seeds that they're not gonna, I mean, you set yourself up for a dramatic shift in how the chapter is perceived and how, um, you know, I mean, sometimes you have a mass exodus. You guys have seen chapters succeed and fail for all kinds of different reasons. And sometimes it comes down to one person. So, um, but yeah, then that's the other thing. It's like I, I talked about wanting to like my clients. I mean, one bad client can um, can ruin an organ a company our size because it stresses everybody out and relationships are strained. So we try to vet them on the front end. Um, so I, I hope I answered your question. Uh, in some way yeah, yeah. The, the only thing I would add in there for you to just give a little color on is the concept of love, which is always interesting us having if some of the guys sitting around saw you and I talking about love, but uh, talking about love, because it really is built in on we might be different. I mean, we had a number of uh, folks in the chapter that didn't really necessarily like each other. They weren't going to go out <laughs> to dinner together. It's always one of the big pieces that I get frustrated in the fraternity, you go visit a group and they're like, we want to make sure that everybody in the group loves each other, right? Like they're all best friends. And I say, guys, that's not reality because that's not how life works. But there was always this in sense of we're all part of the fraternity. And so even though they might not be your best friend, you do love them and look out for them and care about them. And then the other piece that I think as an organization, we've got to continue to get better at, again, just an area that I was blessed is around ritual. And ritual was something that was expected that we did once a month and we dressed up and everyone on campus saw that we were dressed up. And was it something we wanted to do? No. Was it something everybody enjoyed getting dressed up? No. Were the people who got made fun of because of uh, their attire? Yes. And so that was another learning process. But just some of those those attributes that add into to the pieces you're talking about that are built into culture that help to solidify groups and men growing and evolving in the right way. 
you know, the, I, when I think about ritual now and the role it played, that it could have been very easy for me had I not joined Teak um, to have kind of slipped slip through the cracks. My only obligation to Franklin College was paying my tuition and, you know, doing getting grades good enough to not get kicked out. I could have really had a rather unstructured four years um, and and probably missed out on a lot. But the ritual, one, learning it, I mean, the whole pledge education process, um, you know, you got to learn this thing, whether... And by the way, I'm amazed at sometimes how much of I have retained of that. But you, you know, and we had, and it's, it was team building early on, you know, as we're as you're trying to learn. And then, you know, as we're trying to help, you know, the first time you do ritual, you're preparing for it. So we're all working with each other. You're right. We didn't all, you know, like each other and want to go to dinner with each other. Although I think having the early on, early on that exposure to each other, so you can admit there at least, at least I may not like you, but at least I can make that decision determination based on some experience, not just, well, I heard that guy's kind of lame. All right, well, here I know, and I can decide that for myself. Um, but I mean, you're right, Rich, I, mean, I learned how to tie a tie, because <laughs> I know I'm not wearing one right now. Um, I learned how to tie a tie when I was a teak. I, that's, I never, owned like you know I that but that's where I learned how to present yourself and I remember how you know we didn't maybe love having a dress up for that one Monday a month but it was pretty nice when the women on campus were like oh hey you look good you're like yeah all right yeah and you know, so <laughs> um and not everybody is all of us are gonna have jobs where we have to you know wear a suit and tie every day or jacket and tie every day but um but that would it, it, I want to say that that kind of introduction of discipline in a way that wasn't like my brother went through a boot camp, but you know, I think some of the, I think there's some real benefits to that, but he was in fraternity. So he learned that. So it was not a foreign concept to him when he's, you know, being taught here, this is how it runs. This is the, our values. These are what we, this is how we treat each other. You don't have to like each other, but you're going to respect each other and, and you're going to act, behave, you know, when you're, you know, you're going to, you don't, maybe you didn't want to be at the chapter meeting, but you're going to show up because that's what you do because being part of this organization is more than just writing a dues check. It's more than that. And, and, you know, we see these organizations now, there's a, a another organization here in town that I've um, actually on the waiting list to try to join us. Um, but it's a club. It's not like a country club where you just pay your dues, show up when you want. And that's your only obligation. This is a club where they pitch in and they go and they do spring cleaning and all that. And I remember like, I haven't cleaned a toilet probably since the chapter house. You know, I, you know, and um, as you know, someone else, does it. but I clean one there just because, you know, I help. And, and I'm four oh, years yeah. old, I'm a professional, but that's just, so those kind of organizations and the fraternity was the first one I ever got exposed to. And I know there's other people who get involved with Masons or other things where there was an expectation that you contributed more than you took away. And I think the fraternity is a perfect example of that. And I hope that I did contribute it more than I took away because I took a lot from it. And, um, but my hope is that people, even especially active members who are, who are there trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what do I do or what are my talents? Even if you can't figure it out, sometimes just checking in on people or it, 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 seeing, you know, I mean, I, that, that is sometimes um, the easiest thing someone can do and the most appreciated thing that and they'll, they'll never know that really. So um, yeah, I, I I, I could go on, but I, I'll I'll stop there. But I I, I really think I, I and I did, and it, it took you probably asking that question for me to really think about ritual, uh, because, it, but it but that was the early, on the earliest experience that I had of some sort of structure outside of my parents' house. So, well, Brad, we uh we can't thank you enough for for being with us for sharing the inside. I I really appreciate the fact and your ability to tie in a lot of what you've learned professionally back to the fraternity and, and, you know, draw those parallels between what you did 20 years ago, at Franklin college and what you're doing today. And I think, you know, those, those are the lessons that mean so much to our members. And th that's why people join Teak is to learn the lessons that are going to help them be successful throughout the course of their life. So the fact that you continue to pay it forward, the fact that you continue to, to aid other people and assist other people just in the same way that, that you were, you were helped is, uh, is huge and, and can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Uh, let me know how I can be helpful to you guys or other members of uh, Teak's, um, I mean it sincerely. So absolutely. Well, thank you, Brad. We'll uh we'll do it again soon. Absolutely. See you All guys. Right. Thanks, Brad.
And one final gigantic thank you to Brad for joining us. Um, really cool opportunity to get to talk to him and uh, something that hopefully we can continue to, uh, to find more alumni like Brad who have really uh, served at a very high level professionally and, and accomplished a lot in their careers and continue to bring them in, learn from them and uh, just let them talk for a little while. They're a lot smarter than, uh, than I am. So uh, with that, we will allow you to move on with your day. I hope you enjoy your Thanksgiving, spend time with family, watch football, eat turkey, all of that fun stuff. Please don't forget to just smash the freaking like button as hard as you can. Uh, subscribe, uh, like, whatever whatever other buttons exist out there uh, in relation to Teen Nation podcast. Whatever you need to do to make sure that you are the very first person to know when a new episode is released. For Donnie Aldrich, I'm Alex Swenson. Thank you, and we will talk to you soon.